This is the Fractal Design North XL. You can fit so many Fractal Design Terras in this bad boy. Today's video is brought to you by me. Check out craftcomputing.store for all of my official merch and help fund the content that you enjoy watching here on the channel. From custom laser engraved pint glasses to coasters and whiskey stones, and even our brand new double wall insulated coffee tumblers, all of my merch is designed 100% in-house and made to order by me. I'm also now offering flat rate international shipping to 23 different countries. And if you live in the continental US, free shipping on orders over $35. So what are you waiting for? Head on over to craftcomputing.store and start drinking like a pro. Cheers, everyone. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. And it wasn't obvious, today we're gonna to be taking a look at the Fractal Design North XL, the latest case from Fractal Design based on the North, which they released about a year ago today. Now, I typically don't like doing just regular case reviews, and that's not what we're gonna to do today. Today, we are doing a full system build. And this is one that I've been trying to put together for quite some time, and it's taken a little while to get all the components exactly the way I want. And if it wasn't obvious, this is going to be one hell of a system. Before we get into it, I do want to say thanks to Fractal Design, AMD, Thermaltake, and Noctua for sending over parts for today's build. But like all reviews on the channel, no money changed hands. All these companies have no input over the content or production of this video, nor will they see it before it goes live on YouTube. So what exactly are we building today? Well, I kind of want a new workstation, not because I need one, but because I want one. And AMD was gracious enough to send over their all new Threadripper 7980X. This is their 64 core Zen 4 Threadripper. I don't know if anyone needs this, but I'm happy to run it through its paces. Aside from just the memes of having 64 cores in a workstation, there's actually a number of things that I want to test with this more in a virtualized environment. Can I virtualize my workstation and then run a bunch of extra virtual machines for extra processing? Can I do multi-headed workstations or do GPU bifurcation with the GPU that I plan on using in the system? Lots of things that I wanna test out. And if any of that sounds interesting to you, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any of that upcoming content. Now, because I'm impatient and a little excited, uh, I already installed the CPU and RAM onto the motherboard and did a little bit of validation testing before this video. And this thing is an absolute work of art. And the reason I wanted to wait until this came out was I wanted this to be a full matching system. I wanted this to look like a piece of art. Uh, this is the ASUS WS TRX50 Sage motherboard. And this thing is drop dead gorgeous. Now, if you know anything about the all new AMD 7000 Threadripper series, you know that they use DDR5 ECC registered DIMMs identical to what you would find in an AMD Epic server. And for better or for worse, I like that AMD is focused on enabling ECC for this level of system. Workstation systems should have ECC memory available to them. But you do have to keep in mind that also significantly raises the price of the platform overall. You're going to spend probably at least double on ECC registered DIMMs as you would on standard DDR5 memory DIMMs. For this build, we've got four 32 gigabyte sticks of G-Skill Zeta R5 Neo DDR5 registered ECC modules running at 6,400 mega transfers per second. And that's one of the reasons that I wanted to put this platform together before I started doing the build was I wanted to validate we'd actually be able to run at that memory speed. And spoiler alert, yes, we are. Now, one of the main reasons I find myself wanting to upgrade back to a high-end desktop platform is actually for PCI Express connectivity. Right now, my workstation is an Intel i9-13900K with an RTX 3090 and a 100 gigabit network card. And that 100 gig card has actually been non-functional for me for quite a long time. Reason being is I only have a PCI Express 3.0 by four slot to install that card to. And that just has not been enough bandwidth to actually even turn the card on. The system does not want to use the card on anything less than an X8 slot, which means basically every consumer motherboard that I've ever wanted to use is off the table because they only have 24 PCI Express slots between them and 16 of those are used by the graphics card. 
Moving to the 7980X Threadripper, we have 48 PCI Express Gen 5 lanes and an additional 32 PCI Express Gen 4 lanes. Now this board has two PCI Express 5.0 X16, one PCI Express 4.0 X16, an additional PCI Express 5.0 X8, and a PCI Express 4.0 X4. We also have three total M.2 slots for SSD expansion. Two of those are PCI Express Gen 5x4, and then the third slot is a PCI Express Gen 4x4. That's a massive amount of PCI Express connectivity, and it also fetches a fairly high price. This platform, as should be a shock to no one, is very, very expensive. But the irritating thing about where we are at between our consumer and high-end desktop platforms right now, and I've harped on this a number of times, is PCI Express expandability is kind of that middle ground that no one wants to touch. On consumer chips, we have either 20 or 24 PCI Express lanes, and the lion's share of those go to the graphics card slot with an X16. That leaves pretty much nothing for expandability, even in the case of SSDs. If you have an i9-13900K from Intel and you need more PCI Express connectivity, tough luck, go buy an Emerald Rapids workstation. If you have a 7950X powered system from AMD and you want more PCI Express connectivity, tough luck, $1,500 is the cheapest Threadripper option and that's just for the CPU, not including the $1,200 motherboard and registered ECC DDR5 that you're gonna need to make it all work. While this is a great platform, there needs to be less expensive options that offer some PCI Express connectivity. And I wish this was a bigger focus from the industry. But moving right along, keeping things cool, I wanted to keep things as simple as possible. So we're going with the Noctua NHU14S. This is the TR4 based version of this cooler, which is actually not entirely compatible with the TR5 socket that we have here. So Noctua does offer a kit, which you can pick up for just a couple of dollars, which will convert all of their TR4 and SP3 sockets over to the new Threadripper and Epic Genoa systems. This is the NM-TR5 SP6 adapter bracket, and it is compatible with the majority of Noctua's coolers that supported TR4. For the power supply, we are going with the Thermaltake Tough Power GF3 1000 watt power supply. The nice thing about this is it is PCI Express Gen 5 ready with the 16 pin high power 12 volt rail, which means all of the cables should be native, none of the weird adapters to plug into the new NVIDIA cards. It's also fully modular and fairly compact. I think you're gonna be a little bit surprised when you see the size of this power supply. For storage, I'm going back to a couple units that I've used before, and that is the tried and true Western Digital SN770. These are two terabyte PCI Express Gen 4x4 drives. Unfortunately, I don't have any Gen 5 drives at the moment to test out, but I hear those should be coming any day now. We'll have to uh, swap one of these out once the PCI Express Gen 5 drives arrive. When it comes to the graphics card, this one I actually did wrestle with for a little bit. My current workstation has an RTX 3090, which is a 24 gigabyte GDDR6X card. Now my primary use for this workstation is not for playing games. It's actually for video editing and doing some other professional work. Now the RTX 3090 does a fantastic job at all of this. And I was actually considering not upgrading just to keep the 24 gigabytes of GDDR6X. However, when I was looking at my actual utilization, even when doing some of my larger video projects, I'm flirting with between 10 and 14, maybe 16 gigabytes of memory use. So I decided to contact NVIDIA and have them send over an RTX 4080 Super. This is a fantastic graphics card, and even though we are taking a step backwards to 16 gigabytes of memory, I think this should fill my needs just fine, while also giving me a pretty substantial performance boost because you know, I still do play games on this. Best of all, the 4080 Super is a 100% matte black card, which should match the matte black interior of basically every other component that I've chosen to go inside of here. I mean, look at this, even the M.2s are black PCBs. So that's everything laid out on the table or more appropriately on the floor next to me because well, this case is really big. What do you say we go ahead and get this thing together?
that is not a classy AF pairing, I don't know what is. So the build is all done. Uh, this was an absolute joy to build in. Normally, high-end desktop systems, super complex, super expensive, you know, video cards, motherboards, they come with their own set of challenges a little bit beyond what the standard PC might entail. They're a little bit larger. They, they're a little bit more difficult to fit in. They require a little bit more finesse to actually drop them into place. I had miles of room on every single component installing it into the North XL. And even when installed, it's amazing how small these parts look. The RTX 4080 Super looks downright average size inside of this massive case, if that gives it some context. That Noctua NHU14 looks like an average tower cooler. That's a dual 140 millimeter fan cooler, and it's just kind of floating there in the center of this case. It's insane how large this case actually is. So basically, you don't have to worry about size regardless of what component you want to install into this thing. There's going to be room. On top of that, I'm actually really impressed with the number of fans that you can install in this case as well. We've got 340 millimeter fan slots up front or support for up to a 360 millimeter radiator. But on top, we have an additional triple 140 millimeter fans, and there's actually room for a 420 millimeter radiator. Something that with this Threadripper, I might take advantage of in the very near future. This is quite possibly one of, if not the largest case that you can buy for under $200. But it seems the main goal of this case is to simply house larger components, not to house more components. Let me explain. On top of oversized components, large cases like this typically attract people who are also looking for some more storage expandability. But the North XL only supports a pair each of two and a half inch SSDs and three and a half inch hard drive trays. And there's a reason I mentioned that the power supply in the Thermaltake GF3000 watt was so small. And that's because if that power supply was any larger, I would actually have to ditch one of those hard drive trays on the bottom as the power supply would extend too far. If you're wanting the ultimate case for a home lab or a storage server, there's still the Define 7 or the Define 7 XL with their 14 hard drive mounting points. But if you're looking for a storage server, the North XL is not going to be what you want. And that's not to say that's a bad thing. They're just two very different designed cases. That did get me thinking, though, about some previous Fractal Design cases I've reviewed, like the Define 7. In fact, one of my comments in that review was that the Define 7 was built like a tank. Now, the North XL is built from basically the exact same materials. It's the same thickness of steel. It's the same size panels. It's There's a lot of similarities in how Fractal builds a lot of their cases. But... There's a difference in the overall layout of the case. This is a much more open design than the Define 7 was, and that open space inside of the North XL does seem to come at the cost of some of its sturdiness. Because there's fewer internal panels, there's less gusseting and less triangulation. And because this is a much longer case, that means there's more leverage on the individual corners. Don't get me wrong, the North XL is still plenty stout. I mean, I've got what, nearly $8,000 in hardware in here. But it doesn't have quite the same premium feel as, say, the Define 7 did. Now, one of the big advantages of such a large case is there is so much room for cable management. Uh, I think I used two zip ties in the entire case. Other than that, I just used the built-in Velcro ties for cable management in the back, and this thing turned out absolutely exquisite. One thing you might have noticed about this build was I didn't install any additional fans. Part of that was I'm a little undecided on what I want to do up here, as well as if I want to go water cooling eventually. With just the trio of 140 millimeter fans that are included in the North XL up front, my 350 watt Threadripper 7980X still only reached a max temperature of 77 degrees in some of my early testing. And that was after running Cinemage R23 in back-to-back -back stress tests. But that leads me to what is probably my biggest gripe of the North XL with Fractal Design, and it's something they could probably fix pretty easily if they wanted to. And that's that the included fan hub on this is only a four fan hub, yet they have six fan slots on here. They've previously offered seven fan hubs in the Define 7. And so why they decided to scale that down to only four fans 
it's kind of a mystery to me. That is such a huge value add when it's included in the case, and one less thing that a consumer has to buy, you could very easily just knock $20 off the price if you were pricing out a build on PC Part Picker. Dropping from a 7-fan hub on some previous cases down to a 4 does feel like a bit of a regression, and it's something that's not a terribly expensive part. They're already spending the money on a 4-fan hub. A 7-fan hub can't be that much more in parts. So that is something I would genuinely like to see changed. Overall, this is still a very solid entry into Fractal's lineup. While I do have a couple minor gripes about it, if the Torrent or the Define 7 were perfect scores, the North is still an 8.5 out of 10. I'd like to see a couple things tweaked, specifically the larger fan hub. But like I mentioned a minute ago, this is still one of the largest cases you can buy for only $179, and it's definitely one of the best looking cases that's on the market today. If you're interested in my review of the Threadripper 7980X, you will have to subscribe and check back, as that's obviously going to take me more than a day of playing around with it. Like I said, in the first half of the video, I'm planning on doing some virtualization experiments, as well as a number of performance tests and use cases for a build like this, because who even needs a 64-core CPU? If you're interested in the Fractal Design North XL or any of the parts from today's build, I will have affiliate links down in the video description. Make sure to go give those a look. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on all the social medias at Craft Computing. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider going over to craftcomputing.store, picking up one of our fantastic rocks glasses or nucleated pint glasses, and start drinking like a pro. That's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. That is an interesting one. You thought I forgot about the cocktail. Oh, oh no. Uh, so today we are making a small dinger. Small dinger. Uh, <laughs> I've got quite a few cocktail books and recipe sources. Uh, one of my favorites is the 12 bottle bar uh, from David and Leslie Salmonson. Uh, and in this book, they have a cocktail called The Small Dinger, which they stole from another book uh, called Bar La Florida Cocktails. And it's not even a recipe that's written in that book. It's like in the foreword of that book. So not exactly a well-known cocktail here, but uh, this one kind of caught my eye. Uh, one ounce of white rum, one ounce of dry gin, uh, half ounce of lime, and a half ounce of grenadine. Shake and pour over uh, or into a glass. So that's what we're gonna make today. You know what, I'm gonna scale this up ever so slightly just for camera. I'm gonna do ounce and a quarter of each of these. So uh, for my dry gin, I've got a Bombay Sapphire, fantastic inexpensive bottle. Most places it's sub $20. For the rum, this is a very special bottle. This is one that I've had for a number of years and it's unfortunately starting to get down there. Oh, that still smells wonderful. Uh, so I do need to use it before too long, uh, but this is Kula. This is uh, a Hawaiian made rum that you can only buy in Hawaii. Uh, so, yes. Ounce and a quarter of that. That doesn't specify any garnish, but uh, anytime I do a shaken tiki style drink, I always like to uh, garnish with a lime wheel. It just looks better that way. And we're gonna juice half of a lime. If you're doing a lot of drinks, uh, one of the hand-pressed juicers works really well. I've used those before. If you're just doing a single drink, I like not having to clean up the juicer when I'm done. So literally just squeezing it with your fingers, you get the same amount of juice out of it. And then this calls for a half ounce of grenadine. Normally I make my own grenadine, but I'm actually out of grenadine. It's just pomegranate syrup. Uh, so instead we're gonna go with the tried and true roses grenadine. Not my favorite, but it certainly gets the job done. Now we're going to shake. Post a smile. Oh, come on. No. Froze to my pint glass. Or contracted to my pint glass. There we go. All right, that was exciting. Oh, what a good color.
And there we have a small dinger. So the small dinger, uh, obviously it's an interesting combination with a dry gin and a white rum. Those are two spirits that don't belong together. Uh, in this case, it actually gives a, a nice kind of mellow blend. It's like a slightly richer gimlet, if I had to call it anything. The gin is definitely what carries this drink. And then the rum kind of fortifies the body of it a little bit. Uh, it makes it a little less thin, a little less tart. Like I said, it just kind of rounds everything out. I really like that combo. What I'm not digging is the Rose's Grenadine. While everything seems fairly well balanced through about 80% of the flavor, kind of like if you're sensitive to Splenda or Stevia or any other like artificial sweetener, that Rose's pokes its head in right at the very end and then just stays there and lingers. Honestly, it kills any amount of like that I have for this drink. Uh, <laughs> look, I, I love Rose's Grenadine and like a Roy Rogers or something like this, but I don't think it belongs in this cocktail. This is definitely one I'm gonna have to try again with some actual grenadine, some actual pomegranate syrup, and uh, see if that just changes the whole game. I'm betting it will. This is definitely one to re-explore, and I don't think it's one to skimp out on ingredients for. So keep that in mind, but uh, hey, every result's a result. Cheers, everyone.